Okay, welcome back everyone to Is Government the Problem? A Seminar in Economic Federalism, hosted by the Liberty and Ethics Center. Uh, we're gonna hear next from another of the center's fellows, Carrie Roberts, who is a historian. Uh, he's also Associate Dean of the Arts and Sciences at Liberty University, and um, is an expert on Jefferson. And so let's uh, welcome Carrie Roberts. During the 1920s, a profound uh, intellectual debate took place uh, among the world's leading uh, economists and economic theorists. At issue in this debate was the degree to which planned economies could be sustained or even become more productive than capitalist economies. Ludwig von Mises, the famed Austrian economist, commenced this debate in 1920 with a publication of an important paper entitled Economic Calculation in a Socialist Economy, in which he stressed that without a market-based pricing mechanism, producers and consumers lost the important signals, the signals, that is, they used to determine how much to produce and how much to consume. <coughs> if you didn't have prices, production got out of sync with uh, consumption. If you didn't have prices, people would consume as much as they could possibly get. If uh, you didn't have prices, people may not produce anything because they may not get any money for it. And so uh, human productivity, and indeed for Mises, without prices, human civilization itself would collapse. Leading the charge in favor of a socialist uh, or, or centrally planned economy were economists like Oscar Lange, Fred M. Taylor, and Abba Lerner. Their argument rested on um, um, ideas that had were popular a generation earlier, at the turn of the century. Uh, arguments of, of men like Belfredo Pareto, and I, I mean, we've already heard uh, terms like uh, Pareto optimality uh, used here. Leon Walras, uh, all of which claim that managers, over time, managers of this planned economy, uh, would learn how to produce and distribute goods, uh, though their ability to do so rested largely on trial and error. It was not something that they simply knew how much cotton pillowcases to produce. Uh, they would just keep trying this out, and eventually they would figure out that you need to produce so many cotton pillowcases uh, for such and such a, a size of population. This insistence by Mises that markets produced signals, signals by which entrepreneurs made their decisions, would serve as the foundation of, of what we might call today Misesian economics. Uh, Mises' business cycle theory rested on the belief that fractional reserve banking practices uh, whereby banks uh, uh, created uh, money beyond what they had in, in deposits, that this inflation of the money supply uh, would, would, would move um, uh, money beyond what is needed for sustainable market demand uh, for, for goods and services. Uh, that, that's really a gross explanation of Mises' business cycle theory. You can look it up. <laughs> um, but the point here is that uh, for Mises, without properly market-based prices, prices which were created, let's, let us not forget, by the humane interaction of human beings cooperating with each other, entrepreneurs would gain unreliable signals that caused them to invest and produce things that people really didn't want or were unwilling to purchase uh, at, at, at the uh, prices that producers charged. In effect, entrepreneurs, um, according to Mises, uh, when the pricing system was out of whack, would respond to artificial signals uh, that did not represent genuine consumer demand. And, and I'll, I may come back to this later as time permits. 
It's thought now that Mises effectively won this socialist calculation debate in the 1920s uh, because of his emphasis on prices, that an economy could not properly function unless the price system was, was uh, protected uh, from, from, from uh, political distortions. But there was another side of this argument that um, I want to focus upon. Mises' student, Frederick von Hayek, also from, from Austria, extended Mises' arguments, but, but Hayek also added an important part to this calculation debate, something of his own. Hayek believed the problem of central planning rested not so much on the problem of our absence of prices or the distortion of pricing signals, but the problem rested on the abundance of knowledge needed to run an economy. It wasn't just enough that, that planners could kind of uh, uh, go through trial and error and, and find out how much to the things to produce. Hayek argued that, uh, at least in the 1920s, it was fundamentally impossible for planners to even know where to begin. They simply could not gather enough information. Hayek uh, uh, really explained this in a number of articles on what he called the knowledge problem. Uh, and what he later will call in his famous book, The Constitution of Liberty. That by freely making knowledge available, allowing those who can get the right kind of knowledge to make economic decisions, that a society would foster what he called a constitution of liberty, and that society would then flourish. At the time, Hayek insisted that there was no invention then known to man that could collect enough information to effectively run an economy that offered sustainable growth. No government held that level of information and, or informative power, nor was there anything on Hayek's horizon in the 1920s, and the 1930s, and the 1940s, and the 1950s, and the 1960s, till his death. Um, nothing that um, uh, indicated planners would ever get it, that planners would ever have a machine that would give them the information they needed. Uh, I'll come back to this point in part two of the lecture, by the way, tomorrow. Now, Frederick Hayek went on to win a Nobel Prize for his explanation of the knowledge problem. Uh, and even to this day, uh, we, we give Austrian economists like Hayek credit for this, this, this aspect of the knowledge problem, that, that it's impossible for central planning to work because central planners just don't have enough information. Um, what I would like to do, though, is to draw your attention uh, to the fact that this was not the first time. The 1920s was not the first time in Western civilization when intellectuals debated the question of central planning. Nor was this the first time that arguments on both sides of the debate, we do this by trial and error, or we can <coughs> rely upon prices, uh, were, were actually discussed. There was a time in American history when the framework of this debate occurred, and the framework of this debate occurred in widely uh, known circles, Indeed, there was a time almost exactly 100 years earlier, in the 1820s, when Americans of nearly every rank and file discussed the efficiency and efficacy of central planning and even addressed what Hayek later called the knowledge problem. We did not need Austrian economists to teach us about this. Americans knew this a hundred years earlier. Um, and I might, I might add, um, I don't think anyone has addressed this um, since, the, since the antebellum period. Uh, this is actually a debate that Americans have forgotten. So you're learning about this for the first time in a century and a half. Um, on this earlier occasion, you see, in the 1820s, the lead actors in the debate were not scholars, they were not teachers, they did not write articles, they did not deliver academic papers, they did not 
uh, teach at universities or the halls of other uh, uh, academies in America. Rather, in the 1820s, and this may surprise you, the chief actors in this intellectual debate were none other than American politicians. And to be precise, the avenue in which this debate took place was in the halls of the United States Congress. You see, in the 1820s, American congressmen were among the um, literally the smartest people in the country. That was sort of a joke, but it's okay if you don't, <laughs> you don't laugh at it. <laughs> it's sad. Um, and it's to this event in the 19th century that I wish to turn my attention to this presentation. So um, in this presentation will look at the 19th century, and the next presentation tomorrow will look at how federalism and, and, and the issues of market failure play out in the 20th century up until uh, the early 21st century today. In the 1820s, the United States stood at more than one crossroad in history. In fact, I think it could be argued that the 1820s may very well have been one of the most important decades in our 400-year uh, history in, in North America. Uh, maybe not the most important, but certainly one of the top two or three uh, of decades in that history. It was the last decade, you see, in which the revolutionary and founding generation still impacted national politics. Uh, Thomas Jefferson and John Adams both died uh, in, in 1826. James Monroe, um, uh, who fought in the American Revolution, was, was president uh, during the early part of the decade. Um, uh, John Adams' son, John Quincy Adams, uh, was also president of the United States in that decade. Andrew Jackson, who lived during the American Revolution and was apparently brutally beaten by a British soldier during that, uh, the War of Independence, uh, uh, was president at the, at the very end of that decade. So not only do we have the older generation, but we also have that next generation uh, on the scene, one that included some of our most famous and, and arguably some of our most important congressmen uh, so far in American history. Uh, we think in terms of the great triumvirate, as they were called, uh, the three leaders of Congress, Henry Clay of Kentucky, Daniel Webster of, of, of New Hampshire and Massachusetts, and John C. Calhoun of, of South Carolina. Also president, were, president in Congress were men like Martin Van Buren of New York, uh, who almost single-handedly created the second party system, uh, which was the origin of the American Democratic Party today. Three key issues in the 1820s um, focused Congress's attention. Western expansion, central banking, and federal tariffs on imports. And all three of these issues involved the questions about the role of the United States government in the American economy, and they consistently raised questions about market failures. So if we want to go back and consider a period in which congressmen addressed very, very clearly in a, in a focused manner, the notion of market failure, we can look to the 1820s. But please be aware, they're not using our term market failure. They are using other terms to describe that situation. And that's essentially what I wish to talk about this afternoon. How did Congress deal with this issue of market failure? How did other politicians in the United States deal with this issue of market failure in antebellum America? What happened? How do they correct it? How do they perceive it? And then tomorrow, we'll look at how politicians in the 20th century perceived market failure and how they attempted to correct those issues. There are two fundamental, fundamentally different perspectives with two fundamentally and diametrically opposed results. <clears throat> On the one hand, in the 1820s, were those who insisted that economic growth demanded the planning of Congress. And uh, the federal government would play a central role through its power of taxation and its control over money and what constituted money. 
On the other hand were those who believed the country was already too diverse and too large for any semblance of reasonable economic direction. We think the country's too large and diverse today. There are folks in the 1820s when we only had just a few million people, uh, which the population of several states today exceeded the population of the United States in the 1820s, and politicians say there's no way we can control this. It's, it's a hopeless cause, and it's best that we not try and control it. Now, there was, of course, a vast middle ground between the, the two groups, but that did not uh, uh, prevent these two sides from dividing into what became two distinct political parties. And these two distinct political parties ultimately laid the foundation of what historians and political scientists call the second American party system. Uh, this was a party system that eventually turned into one between Democrats and Whigs, W-H-I-G-S, not Whigs, you are in your head. <laughs> Whigs, as in the, the uh, they copy themselves after the English Whigs. In the 1820s, though, they did not call themselves Democrats or Whigs. Instead, they called themselves two distinct strains of Republicans. They all considered themselves to be the followers of Thomas Jefferson and the inheritors of President Jefferson's legacy. They did not call themselves Washingtonians. They did not call themselves Federalists. They did not call themselves Hamiltonians. They all called themselves Republicans, just two different kinds. On the one hand uh, were those who believed most heavily in national political planning. They called themselves national Republicans because they believed in national uh, uh, principles, national planning. Uh, and they were led by Henry Clay, arguably one of the most important uh, um, members of, of Congress uh, ever, uh, Henry Clay from Kentucky. Their support was strongest in places like New England, New York, outside of New York City, uh, northern New York, and Pennsylvania. They eventually became the core uh, around which the American Whig Party formed. Now, those who believed the federal government could not plan the national economy went by the term Old Republican and were led by men such as John Randolph of Virginia, Nathaniel Macon of North Carolina, along with a host of, of men mainly but not exclusively from the American South. Now, many things divided these uh, factions, and, I, and I, I'm not going to go into any great detail over those things. Instead, I wish to concentrate and on what I consider to be the most important thing that, that kept them apart. And it was, in effect, what, what we might call the unwritten constitution of American society. And I use that as a play off of Hayek's contention of a constitution of liberty, but a, but a constitution of American society, not the written United States constitution that began, we the people, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and all for it, but an unwritten constitution, mm -hmm. a societal constitution, mm -hmm. one that involved a myriad of overlapping social, economic, political, and religious relationships, each of which competed to command a person's allegiance. This was the federal nature of American society. Uh, one that had been in place long before our independence from Great Britain. Indeed, our independence from Great Britain only confirmed what most Americans already knew. That in a world where uh, various forms of societal relationships competed for our attention, it meant there really was nothing that was truly sovereign over our lives. Uh, we, we see this really resonate with Americans in the summer of 1776 when they first begin using this term uh, uh, sovereignty of the people. If the people are sovereign, if the people have power, then in effect nothing is sovereign. 
because the people are, 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 are all distinct and individual from each other. <clears throat> Through the process of colonization, uh, the transfer of the English common law system, the presence of a Western frontier, the, um, both the aggravations and the cooperation of uh, literally hundreds of distinct Indian bands and villages, and the articulation of libertarian ideas and principles, all of these things together had, by the time of the War of Independence, eliminated any single authority over people's lives. And Americans knew this. Now, that did not mean all Americans were happy about this, as we'll see in just a moment, but Americans still knew it. You see, a singular authority, uh, one which uh, Don Livingston and others have discussed in this conference, a singular authority was quite common in early modern Europe. Uh, where, where we saw things such as established religion, politically directed legal systems, uh, large standing armies, monarchs who called themselves sovereign, which was a, a term, which is a religious term, by the way, uh, initially employed to describe the attributes of God. God was sovereign. God had omnipotence. He had omnipresence. Uh, he was uh, the controller and supreme arbiter of all things. A French political theorists thought that was a great thing for the king to have. <laughs> and so they simply borrowed that term and said, oh, we'll start calling the king sovereign as well. Um, and above all, early modern Europeans had the modern state that had evolved out of uh, several wars in the 17th century. <clears throat> These things existed in North America, and some of them may have existed in parts of, 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 excuse me, these things existed in Europe, and some of them may have existed in parts of North America, but by and large they were absent. And efforts to steadily consolidate this decentralized uh, sort of constitution of American society, efforts to do this constantly met still resistance. You see, Americans may not have loved vestiges of feudal Europe, like titles of nobility, canon law, or other examples of European uh, um, feudal orders. But like it or not, um, Americans at the end of the 18th century lived in a world that looked remarkably like medieval Europe. It looked remarkably more like medieval Europe than it looked like modern, late 18th, early 19th century Europe. And it certainly looked more like medieval Europe than it will ever look like modern 19th and 20th century Europe. <clears throat> The society that I've just described endured the War of Independence, was protected by the United States Constitution, and necessitated the federal political institutions and protections um, uh, and protection of state governments. However, Americans did not uniformly seek to conserve these kinds of things, nor to uh, uniformly uh, conserve the, this kind of decentralized society. You see, the National Republicans of the 18-teens and the 1820s insisted that these kinds of competing parallel societies, of competing parallel allegiances, of competing legal jurisdictions, of competing political spheres between state governments and municipal governments and state governments and the federal government that these things needed to be unified. If Americans needed anything, national republicans insisted Americans needed sovereignty. They needed a sense of sovereignty. They needed a government that was sovereign. Mm -hmm. Other Americans had no trouble with this. They did perfectly well living in this kind of world. 
They had no trouble managing their social obligations in a healthy manner without obligating their lives to only one person, one group, one institution, one idea, one religion, one store, one form of literature, one form of music. They did not need one form of anything to order their lives. Instead, they, in their own interaction with each other, this group of Americans brought uh, order to their lives almost unknowingly as they navigated through these different distinct parallel societies. Not even families uh, were untouched by this kind of circumstance. Uh, as as uh, in, in Europe, Families were much easier to hold together. But in North America, that was not the case. Uh, when people had family squabbles, they split. And they, they kissed their loved ones goodbye, and they moved west. They may have changed their name, so instead of spelling it S-M-Y-T-H, they spelled it S-M-I-T-H. Uh, the remarkable freedom of Americans to change their own names is a testimony to this kind of, of world of parallel societies. <clears throat> Nobody needed to carry around banners, as they do today, exclaiming how they were red devils, panthers, crusaders, uh, eagles, redskins, stealers, <laughs> Packers, and a number of other mascots for which I don't, I don't think any of us really know what they are. I, I used to work at an institution where we were the Wonder Boys. <laughs> <laughs> now I work at an institution where we are the Flames. We are the Lions. Um, nobody thought of themselves as a Coke person or a Pepsi person. <laughs> People cooperated. They worked for common ends. And someone somehow managed to feed themselves. And they fed each other without any overarching authority telling them what to do. America in the 18 teens and the 1820s is an example of spontaneous social order. And it meets uh, Robert Higgs' definition that he provided to us earlier. It was orderly, it was voluntary, and at times it was even predictable. In fact, those who could best predict these relationships tended to be the people who handled it best. They were the most socially adept. They were those who lived in the most vibrant communities. They were the ones who, in some cases, were the most conservative because they understood that conserving these social institutions and their competition with each other is what had led to American liberty. Communities where people thrived were communities that were decentralized, such as those found in the South and in the West and in many rising urban areas from New York City westward um, across the Ohio Valley. These people, as I mentioned, did remarkably well. Places, though, in the country uh, without a long, or excuse me, places where there was a long tradition of rejecting decentralized order, they did not do so well. This is especially true in New England, parts of upstate New York, and places on the western frontier settled by people from New England and upstate New York, or in places where there were high numbers of recent European immigrants. In those areas, people believed that their society was in a, a, a state of crisis. In those areas, people believed civilization was on the verge of collapse. Why? Because they could not fathom living in a world where there was not some common moral center around which all members of that community revolved. They could not fathom living in a world of parallel societies where each one has its own moral center competing for the allegiance of, of, of people. Those people, you see, 
were the ones who complained the most and often argued that political institutions used, had to be used to bring order and uniformity to their communities. To put this very blunt, these are the people who are arguing that there is something wrong with the American economy, that the American economy is failing because our societies and communities are too diverse. There's not one thing holding it all together. If you're interested, though it's slightly after uh, what, what I'm, I'm discussing here, um, you should read Abraham Lincoln's address to the young men's uh, uh, Lyceum, which is his first public address, and you get a real sense of this attitude that civilization is slipping away because there's nothing holding us together around a common moral center. Lincoln could not fathom a decentralized society. In effect, these people believe that the natural exchange of goods and services, religious practices, or even competing traditions um, uh, were signs of societal failure. Uh, they would have identified competition among these social institutions for our allegiance <clears throat> by the term we use today, market failure. Either free exchange of goods and services fosters societal division, or according to national republicans, it prevented the level of unity people needed to achieve true national progress. And that's really the term that they are using here, uh, progress. And that's a, a, a term that captured everyone's attention at this period of time and served as a, a, a kind of litmus test of, of, of societal order. Were you living in a progressive community? Now, that, that, that progress was, was measured differently than the way we will measure a progressive community in the 20th century. Now, I'll, I'll leave that for tomorrow. But suffice it to say for now that progress to most early Americans meant economic development along intense industrial lines. That if you had uh, factories, National Republicans argued you have progress. If you don't have factories, then clearly uh, you are falling behind the march of history. Um, Southern planters said, um, if you're making a profit, you, you, you have economic progress. It's not, it's not necessary to have smokestacks to see that. <clears throat> now, by the, by the 1820s, National Republicans insisted the only way for the country to progress came through economic planning um, um, by way of political institutions. America, they urged, would not become a powerful country or even a wealthy empire unless Congress actively encouraged industrialization by levying taxes on imports. We needed to become an industrial nation, we need to have high tariffs, let's tax all this industrial merchandise coming in from Great Britain to a lesser degree, France. Uh, that will give our producers the upper hand. They can produce willy-nilly, hire plenty of American workers, buy lots of Southern cotton, sell it back to, to other Americans in the form of finished textiles. We will each be each other's customer, uh, a phrase Henry Clay liked to throw around, and we will all grow fat and rich together. But it has to be planned. It has to be controlled. It had to be under the direction of Congress. <clears throat> when National Republicans looked at the country, they also saw one that was not heavily settled. And this, this worried them. They feared a society was, that was too dispersed. They, they feared a society in which people lived too far apart. They feared the very kind of society that men like Thomas Jefferson cherished. For many of the Jeffersonians, the purpose of government was to keep people apart. It was not to bring people together. But for national Republicans, it was quite the opposite. They believed that America needed a broad system of transportation networks, for example a network uh, built by the federal government 
that would link local economies together, that would give people the ability to travel at a much faster rate of, of, of speed, and to sell their products back and forth more effectively. And I would like to take a moment here to, to step aside and to, and to explain something, and that is America has no genuine socialist tradition in which someone stands before history and yells, stop, at least in terms of economic development. And you've got a few people who play around in utopian communities. And you have quite a few people in the 20th century with the environmental movement. But by and large, those are marginal political traditions that, that never have gained national preeminence. Instead, instead, what we really have in the United States is competition between two traditions. One saying, let's allow economic growth to proceed slowly and naturally, supported by consumer demand as we go. And another tradition that says, we need to hurry up. We want economic development. We want all the advantages of capitalism and markets. But we want those things right now. We don't want to wait. And as a politician, I can campaign and promise you that I am going to bring those kinds of things to your local community. I'm going to bring a canal. And that canal will, will, will prove to be a river of progress as we exchange ideas and as we exchange goods and services and all grow right, fat and wealthy together. Old Republicans countered this argument time and time again. And for the sake of, sake of time, let me summarize it by stating, they counter the National Republicans with arguments eerily similar to those Frederick Hayek used 100 years later. Take, for example, uh, one of my favorites, Philip Barber of Virginia. Barber's family um, came from the north central part of the state. Uh, they were a politically active family, friends of Thomas Jefferson and James Madison. Philip's brother James uh, was also a politician, a senator. He served in the presidential cabinet of John Quincy Adams. Uh, Philip Barber himself eventually became an associate justice on the United States Supreme Court uh, and is someone who has long since been forgotten by American historians. On the 26th of March, 1824, during a heated debate on increasing the federal tariff, Barber laid out the case of the old Republicans. Relying somewhat on Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations, and yes, congressmen at that period of time did read the Wealth of Nations, and they read him and they read uh, all sorts of philosophical tracts. Philip Barber laid out, as I said, the old Republican case. And I'll, 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 right, excuse me, I'll deliver here a few extended quotations. He began by stating, quote, the sum of my doctrine is this, that the wealth of a nation is an aggregate of the wealth of the individuals who compose it that there is an instinct implanted in man, the master spring of his actions, which through life impels him to a perpetual endeavor to better his condition. And that this principle, acting alike upon all, without concert, without even looking to the public interest, in other words, without any form of central planning, Every man in society is constantly endeavoring to increase his portion of wealth, and consequently, every man is laboring to add to the stock of public wealth. An increase of a whole being the inevitable result of an increase of all of its parts. He went on, still quoting here. From these principles, this corollary is deduced that government should never interfere but in matters of state. That is, he said, in relationship to the internal police of a country. It has done all that is required of it, all that is out to do, 
when it has secured to its citizens their personal property and private property and an impartial administration of judgment. This is in 1826. Now such follow the standard classical liberal argument that was fairly common in the 18th and 19th century, but, but Philip Barber made a few additional comments and he, he noted, again quoting, before then it can be justified to invoke the aid of government upon this subject, meaning encouraging the economy, it is incumbent upon those who would do so to prove, and here we go, that government knows better how to direct this desire which all acknowledge to be universal than the individual citizens themselves. This they cannot do, but on the contrary, I think it can be clearly shown not only that government does not know better, but that it does not know so well. Nay, that in the nature of things, it is and must be wholly incompetent to ever take on the task. And I close the quotation, it is beyond the means of our information. Mm. Now this effectively summarizes an argument Frederick Hayek made from which he received a Nobel Prize. <laughs> uh, I, I, I will not claim that Hayek plagiarized uh, Congressman Barber, but I think it is eerily similar. And perhaps goes to show that true principles of, of human exchange um, can be known to lots of people over the course of time without them knowing it, knowing each other. Barber's was a lengthy speech, and, and while not now long forgotten, uh, five days after this, Henry Clay went before Congress and delivered uh, what we call today his American System speech which was arguably one of the top 10 speeches ever delivered in the United States Congress. But what we have forgotten is that speech was delivered in direct opposition to Barber's speech five days earlier. Long and boring. Clay could not counter Barber's knowledge argument. Indeed, all he could say is that God has blessed the United States. We can all see God's blessings, and therefore the government just needs to keep it going. <laughs> he called upon the Lord above and his knowledge. He called upon the knowledge of God to his aid, which he then thought could uh, be easily conferred to the federal government. I quote here, we are the same people, Clay claimed. We have the same country. The showers still fall on the same grateful abundance. The cause of our prosperity, Clay claimed, quote, is to be found in the fact that during almost the whole existence of this government, we, meaning Congress, have shaped our industry, shaped our navigation, and our commerce. In other words, we have controlled our economy and it is the control over that economy by Congress that produced American prosperity. Clay went on to explain that if Americans defer to Congress um, um, to, to properly encourage economic progress, we will all finally become united. He stated, quote, now our people present the spectacle. Ah, I, I love this. It, Here's Clay's depiction of the federal nature of American society. Now remember, I've made the argument, this is the origin of our liberty. And here's how Clay uh, describes it. Our people present the spectacle of a vast assemblage of jealous rivals, mm -hmm. all eagerly rushing to the seaboard, jostling each other in their way, to hurry off to glutted foreign markets the perishable produce of their labor. And if we would just adopt Henry Clay's plans, Congress will, quote, transform these competitors into friends and mutual customers. And by the reciprocal exchanges of their respective productions, 
to place the country upon the most solid of all foundations, the basis of common interest. In other words, for Henry Clay, this diverse society of, 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 of multiple associations competing with each other for people's allegiance actually led America astray. It was demeaning to human uh, dignity for us to have to suffer in such a contentious uh, social arrangement. You see, for Henry Clay, uh, well, let's put it this way, Henry Clay was blaming the federal government for failing the market, not so much market failure on um, 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 the federal activity. And by that I mean, for Henry Clay, what was needed was the federal government to speed the market up, to bring about all those advantages that it had promised to people. Well, what happened? Well, let me cut a, a very long story short. Um, what happened after this? Congress continued to debate. Tariff rates were gradually raised, and tariff rates were lowered. Uh, the country could very well have been placed on the brink of civil war not too many years after these, these uh, uh, speeches were delivered. Um, Andrew Jackson would be elected president. And most vestiges of Henry Clay's American system, his emphasis on, on political control, were actually eliminated. At the national level, Whigs like Henry Clay failed. Their, their, their policies were not uh, put into practice. And so what Whigs did, these people who, again, as I, I repeat myself, wanted more from capitalism, they didn't want to eliminate capitalism, they wanted more from it, they turned their attention to state governments and localities. And from the 1820s through the early 1840s, Whig politicians, with the assistance of quite a few Democrats, I might add, sponsored countless legislation designed to encourage economic progress. They sponsored bills and laws for canals, for turnpikes, for bridges, for road companies, and hundreds of state-sponsored monopolies. The 1830s represented a flush time for forms of economic, uh, uh, excuse me, of political entrepreneurship. Those who wished to use state and local governments to pass on the cost of their production to taxpayers and disperse that cost throughout society, these people boomed. These kinds of things took off. How many of you have ridden in a train? Okay. How many of you have ridden in a canal? Not as a tourist, but you actually, as a, you did not ride as a tourist. Yeah, a couple of them. Uh, I was a canoeist. A canoeist, oh, okay, okay, because it was sort of for fun. You didn't ride in the canal. It wasn't that much fun. You to get something, right? <laughs> right. Uh, well, you see, this, this kind of illustrates an important thing that we need to understand about antebellum America. The Whigs believed in what Bert Folsom calls political entrepreneurship. And by that, Folsom argues a, um, they believed that it was the responsibility of politicians to encourage market development through political controls and that it was the responsibility of politicians to build infrastructure, to build ways in which markets that could be connected. In other words, and to put this in the context, if I may, for Whig politicians, the only way of dealing with that plethora of parallel societies was for government to step in and to artificially connect those different societies and associations. So government needed to build schools so that we could build uh, connections between various forms of knowledge. 
Government needed to build bridges to literally connect two land masses together. Government needed to build canals to connect two populations, a producing population and a consuming population, so that markets could flourish. In other words, it was the important uh, role of government to bridge the gap that existed between these parallel groups. And many times, these various initiatives, whether it was a canal, or whether it was a bridge, or whether it was a turnpike, or whether it was some sort of mining outfit, or whether it was a corporation which had been licensed by the state legislature because the men who owned that corporation had paid the highest bribes to the state legislator. These things at times did make profits. The political entrepreneurship is not sustainable because political entrepreneurs do not read market signals the same way economic entrepreneurs read market signals. Why? Because economic entrepreneurs who do not rely upon political institutions to pass off their costs to others Economic entrepreneurs have to bear the cost of failure. They have to bear the risks. Political entrepreneurs do not. They have their own kind of lender of last resort, taxpayers. And in the same way that for Mises, political, in the same way that, 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 that distortions of, of, of monetary pricing led to misallocation of resources. For many Whig politicians, their misallocation of, of, of resources was fostered by the absence of political pricing, a political pricing mechanism. Let me be very quickly explain what I mean by that. For Thomas Jefferson and the Jeffersonians, and the old Republicans. American voters knew what decisions to make about government because there was a kind of political pricing mechanism, taxes. And if people were not paying the full amount of the government services they received, then that political pricing mechanism was distorted. So whether it was public debt or various economic activities, these things distorted that. Politicians could promise literally the moon because the politicians were not necessarily held accountable to the failure of their, their endeavors. They simply went to taxpayers and raised taxes to cover their costs. Taxpayers, however, quickly learned what was going on. And so by the late 1840s, after a series of, 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 of massive state bankruptcies, the Whig Party came to a screeching halt. Whig politicians were finally voted out of office. The flush times and the boom had led to one of the most serious economic uh, depressions in American history in the mid to late 1830s. It was unsustainable. Well, let me conclude. What was the ultimate consequence here? And I've kind of rushed through this here at the end, so let me, let, me, let me state it one more time. Perception of market failures, which was something in reality deeply rooted in the diverse manner in which Americans organized their lives. It wasn't market failures. It was just the way American society was built. Efforts to correct this had led to uh, political initiatives to centralize control over the American economy. Those efforts failed. They went bankrupt. Nothing was too big to fail in the 1830s and 1840s. There were no bailouts except at the hands of taxpayers who then voted out of office permanently the politicians who had proposed those kinds of schemes. 
And so by the late 1840s into the 1850s, the ultimate consequence of this was a flourishing of America's parallel societies because efforts to control those things had disappeared. And so it paved the path. It allowed for entrepreneurs, not politicians, to devise ways of, of, of connecting those different associations. And this, to me, is one of the great fascinating stories of American society. And I wish I had more time to do it. But let me just uh, uh, say this. Europeans industrialized by creating new means of production, new ways of mining, steam power. And yes, they invented steam locomotives, but not very well, not very good ones. The first one killed the Prime Minister of Britain. Just ran over. The guy didn't know to step out of the way. Um, they invented new forms of production like factories. But in the 1840s and the 1850s, Americans created new forms of communication, new forms of linking people together, not producing more stuff. Not coincidentally, Americans, you see, invented things that allowed them to communicate, to better order their lives, to transverse a millions, literally millions of parallel societies. Things such as telegraph lines, Morse code, uh, mechanical reapers, perfected steam engines that could travel better, uh, such as the uh, modern locomotives, time zones, branch banking, the Pony Express, interchangeable parts that people in one part of society could use to build a gun and people in a whole another part of society could use to build a gun. Um, State licensing and chartering, so rather than secretly paying off legislators, you just go and you pay a fee and they, they make you a chartered business. New forms of music, new forms of literature, a real gold standard, a way, again, of uniting a common monetary society over those different societies, and all countless other inventions that Americans use to transverse the diverse landscape of a world where no person, no thing, and no institution was superior to the rest. It was a decentralized society that produced not an industrial revolution, but a communication revolution. And it is that communication revolution that is the engine of economic progress now in a, in, in a, in a, in a, in a postmodern world. Ladies and gentlemen, it wasn't invented in the 1970s. It was started in the 1850s, in a time when America was far more decentralized politically than we are today. The Civil War interrupted this development. It wrecked the American economy and caused us to lose a generation of economic growth. But the war did not successfully destroy the federal nature of American society. Uh, nor at the time did it raise real legal challenges to the spirit of economic entrepreneurship. And so by the 1880s, a flourishing federal society returned to health. And for the next generation, Americans enjoyed the fruits of this communication revolution and industrialization, which they kind of stole from Great Britain. Uh, but the fruits of these things that literally grew out of a very chaotic situation and the kinds of societies that the National Republicans and the Whigs deplored. Those people lost and Americans won. But that will change in the early 20th century. And I'll talk about that tomorrow. Thank you. Mm -hmm.
some time for question and answer. Do you have a question or are you just kind of waving? Oh, I. If you're not even in the seminar, buddy, we're waving. <laughs> not even in the Anybody have any questions? Dr. Roberts, I was thinking about the way that the talks this afternoon connect with one another. Um, they seem deceptively diverse, but I think they're highly connected because I'm thinking of um, the, the notion of both market feedback mechanisms and I'm thinking of political feedback mechanisms, right? In other words, you can try things and then see that they fail. And when you talked about, uh, you know, Livingston talks about these huge conglomerate political entities in which uh, terrible, as Dr. Wall pointed out, terrible policies can be pursued and no one really understands what happened. Right. So it just sort of gets lost. But you pointed out the opposite situation, which was these local and state efforts uh, to undertake some bad policies. And um, they failed, and everybody saw that they failed, and they kicked the people out, right? I mean, in other words, you, you had the feedback. It was close enough to home that you could retain the information, where now it seems like we can't track cause and effect well enough right. to punish you know, ourselves, right, for our poor decisions, or to, or to, I mean, the punishment is there, but we don't understand it. We don't, we don't understand what, what happened. Right. That's well articulated, far better than I could. Uh, <laughs> the, the issue here, it seems to me, is that the larger the scale of, of, of the, um, the government, or the larger the scale of the, of the country, the more difficult it is to feel failed. And, and feeling failure is absolutely essential to economic uh, progress. Uh, you have to be able to fail. And if you, because if you can't fail, then you really don't know what is or is not a successful uh, and productive um, 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 thing for your society. Uh, if we're not allowed to fail and to feel those effects, then we, we really risk a lot of problems. It's not coincidental, I think, for those people who study effective entrepreneurship, um, they study people like Sam Walton and, and other leading entrepreneurs of the 20th century. Uh, almost all of them at one point went bankrupt early in their, in their lives. Uh, and I might add, an educational system that does not allow children to fail uh, is a, a educational system that will destroy uh, uh, strong entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. uh, it's very dangerous. I, I believe that, as I followed this in your argument or your discussion, that we've actually made a transition from a risk embracing culture to a, a risk averse culture. Um, is there something else going on in, in our nation or on this continent that's contributing to that? Yeah, are you going to be here tomorrow? Are you going to be around tomorrow? Oh, yeah. Okay, good, because that's what I'm going to talk about. <laughs> uh, why do we become risk averse? And there, there are some distinct reasons for that. And it has to do more with ideology, I think, than anything else. Uh, these ideas of the National Republicans, these ideas of the Whigs, I mean, essentially these ideas that uh, a diverse society is not a strong society, uh, a society without a common moral center uh, is not a strong society. Those ideas remain there. They're, they're around. They, they don't disappear. Um, but they were not politically powerful in the last quarter of the 19th century. Uh, partly because people blamed that idea on the Civil War. They blamed it for causing the Civil War. It was discredited for a whole generation. And then it starts coming back by the end of the 1890s into the early 20th century such that now uh, it, 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 is, it, is, it is dominant. It's really dominant up until about the 1990s, and then it, it starts slipping away. That's tomorrow's presentation. Yes, sir? Uh, so I wonder if you knew that there's a new Whig party. Yeah, I've heard about <laughs> this. Uh, Takes the worst elements of the existing parties and combines them into one. Yeah. <laughs> <New> one. <laughs> Isn't that socialism or communism? <laughs> 
Uh, no, I mean, it's, it's really all dedicated to sort of state-sponsored economic development. Uh, sort of a, I mean, if, if, we get, if, we, if it's possible for us to take away the political baggage, it's sort of a proto-fascist kind of system. But in a sense, that's, that is uh, what, what American Whigs were arguing for. Just a brief question. I read somewhere, I think, that uh, most states by, say, 1860 have passed uh, in their constitutions prohibitions against subsidizing business. Right. Is that right? That's true. And it's a response to all the, the state bankruptcies that swept the country in the 40s. Mm. And that was exactly what the Republican nationalists were arguing for. Right. The central government and uh, would subsidize business. Right. So, that's interesting because the states the states have risen to check that and then after the Civil War. Civil right. Government. And you know, that legacy is still with us today in a lot of state constitutions. It's something that nationalists were never quite able to get rid of. Um, and it's also why progressivism was likely shot. This is my argument. I, I mean, I, there are others who have different ways of looking at it. But I, I suspect one of the reasons why progressivism was strongest in Western states is because those were new states that came into the Union after the war, after the 1840s and 50s, and they did not have a lot of those economic restrictions in their state constitutions. Um, so to me, it just seems natural that this kind of national effort toward, toward economic control arose in those new Western states. Um, but I, I, they didn't have a strong identity either. Right, right. Missouri, I think, still has several of those restrictions. I, kn I know Missouri in the 1840s uh, outlawed the state government from going into debt. It could not take out a loan. Arkansas went so far as to outlaw banks. So it had <laughs> one up on you. <laughs> that was obviously too extreme. But, uh, but that's a uh, correction to me. So the, the, the thought that crosses my mind almost every time I hear you speak, I want to say it out loud and see if anyone else relates. And that is that whenever you talk about the, the complex interrelationship of parallel commitments and the tensions we all have to navigate, you know, you talk in those, that sort of language. I'm reminded of conversations I've had with those on the left who said, you know, the modern nation state and capitalism have to go together. You know, you need that unitary currency and those roads and those da da da. You know, and, and I think there's a part of me that that goes there unintentionally, or it's a kind of knee-jerk reaction that I also assume that things need to be streamlined in order to work well. And what you're telling us is that um, people can navigate these traditions and it can be a rich kind of full experience that not only that they can do it, but that that might actually be the source of American entrepreneurship and wealth and inventiveness, which is even more baffling in a way, right? Because the logic, uh, there's some kind of logic, Hobbesian logic in me that wants to say, how is that possible? Won't it be inefficient? if I have to navigate all of these, you know, and hold all these tensions all the time? Well, it's inefficient only if you prevent entrepreneurs from coming up with ways of bridging those commitments yeah. and bringing them together. So the, the, when you have that level of competition, then it prompts people to devise ways of simplification. Right. But they do so freely. They don't, uh, when you interrupt that, See, one of the problems we have in the United States is we try and interrupt that, uh, and it creates intense conflict, uh, really brutal conflict in many ways when we, when, we, when we try and stem the tide of this. You know, it's not easy being an American. I don't know if y'all figured that out yet. Um, it is not simple. It is not easy living in a society where you have to make the decision every day what is going to have uh, uh, allegiance, uh, command your allegiance. Um, you, know, you go to class, your parents are calling. Uh, I'm about to give this presentation and my wife starts wanting to text me. Um, 
In a totalitarian society, I would have had to leave my phone out in the hall. Mm. Uh, think about that when you go to class on Monday and the faculty member says no cell phones. Uh, so, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Try teaching a class when the is going on. <laughs> It sounds like Dr. Duchamp's subjection is really, a, it's a function of time that corrects it. If it's left to its own devices, the, the culture, the society will extremely, the real problem is the initial disruption when something new comes into existence. Right. Or wipe something else out. Right. Because it, it, it focuses our attention on, on the complexity when you have those disruptions. Or when you have, as you just mentioned, it's a great point, when you have the development of some invention that helps us better organize it, it is disruptive. Facebook is disrupted, and it causes us to focus our attention on uh, the complexity of our lives. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm going to talk about Facebook tomorrow. <laughs> well, just very briefly, Plato mentions the uh, problems of constant innovation in the Republic and how it can be disruptive to a community. Yeah, and conservatives don't like this either. Traditional conservatives are very upset with this sort of thing, especially in the United States. Uh, because they they treat these connections themselves as traditions worth preserving rather than think in terms of the associations as something worth preserving. Do you, you understand what I mean by that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. The way in which we order those associations for a lot of conservatives is more important than the associations themselves. Um, and I, I'm convinced this is why a lot of conservatives in America in the 1950s and 1960s thought they could reconnect to the old world and Western civilization and European monarchy and, and because they wanted to live in a society where there was a, a, a uniform sense of authority and there was some authoritative institution that could bring order to the complexity of their lives. Uh -huh. uh, it's particularly true among religious conservatives. Uh, and, well, I'll just leave it at that and say religious conservatives. <laughs> okay, great discussion. So thank you very much, Dr. Roberts.